Hi, it's Michelle, your CSC Biology Tutor. In this past paper solutions video, I'll be looking at the CSET Biology May 2024 paper 2. So let's begin with the section 8 questions. We have question 1. So it says an experiment was set up as shown in figure 1. So we have a Petri dish with some water a raw potato with a well cut out in the middle and some salt crystals placed in this potato well. It says to draw a large clearly labeled diagram in the box provided on page 5 to show what would be observed from this experiment after two hours. All right, let's go to the next page. So this is what I have as my diagram. Just bear in mind, it's not going to be the best looking diagram since it's drawn on a computer, free-handed. So, so here, here is my diagram showing you what you should expect to happen after this experiment has been left for two hours. So I have the Petri dish. You would notice that the water levels have been decreased. We have the salt solution forming inside of the potato well. So this is the salt solution that would have been formed. And I included an arrow, as you can see there in red. And that is just to show the movement of water from the Petri dish across the raw potato and into the potato well where the salt crystals were located. So farming the salt solution as a result. So this is what your diagram should look like. So make sure you have the correct labels and a title for your diagram. So part B, so just a suitable title for the experiment in figure one. So the title I give is an investigation of osmosis in living cells using a potato. So anything similar to that can work as a title, just to show what the experiment is about. So we are investigating osmosis in living cells, which is from the potato. Secondly, the next part says to suggest a suitable hypothesis for the experiment in figure one. So usually, when you think of a hypothesis, you would think of a statement that can be tested to be true or false. So a statement that when you conduct the experiment, you can test if it's going to be true or false. So a suitable hypothesis I have is water will move by osmosis from the Petri dish. So that is an area of high water concentration into the raw potato well of salt crystals where there is a lower water concentration. So I'm just going to refer back to the diagram to explain it a little more. So we have this setup here and we're definitely investigating osmosis because if you understand osmosis involves the movement of water molecules from where there is more water, so that is the high concentration of water, to where there is less water, which would be a low concentration of water, across a selectively permeable membrane. So the potato is going to be behaving like the selectively permeable membrane. It consists of cells and the cells obviously would have in cell membranes and cell membranes are selectively permeable. So the water is going to move from the petri dish across the raw potato and into the potato well where the salt crystals are. So therefore, as I showed you just now, you should expect that there would be a salt solution formed in the potato well. So that is showing that osmosis would have occurred. So that's our hypothesis. Part C, the raw potato in the experiment in figure one is replaced by a boiled potato. However, the remainder of the procedure is unchanged. So it says to suggest two ways in which the observations may differ when the boiled potato is used. So you have to go into answering this question by thinking first of all what 
what is different here in this setup between the boiled potato versus the raw potato? So clearly the potato is boiled. It would have been exposed to a lot of heat. So therefore the cells would have been killed. The cells would have been destroyed in the boiled potato. They're not living cells anymore. So keeping this in mind, you should realize that, well, osmosis is not going to occur as with the original setup that we looked at at the beginning with the raw potato. So the fact that the boiled potato is being used, the cells are not living, so you're not going to expect the same thing to occur as it did in the first experiment. So after the two hours, there will be no solution in the potato well because no water would have moved into the potato well through osmosis. So simply put, osmosis is not going to occur. So you're not going to expect to see that salt solution forming. So the salt would just remain inside the potato well. Those salt crystals will remain the same because no water will be entering that well. And then secondly, you would expect the level of water in the Petri dish to be the same. Once again, there's no osmosis occurring because... The, the cells of the potato have been destroyed, so there's no selectively permeable membrane present. So there's not going to be the movement of water as it would if the potato was not boiled. So osmosis isn't going to take place. So you may have some, some water and possibly might be absorbed by the boiled potato. Um, you, you could imagine the boiled potato would be softer. So you may have a little some of the water absorbing by the potato, but typically you're not going to have that movement like what would have happened with the first experiment when the potato was raw. So no osmosis is going to occur in this situation here with the boiled potato. All right, so that is two marks for that. All right, let's go on to part B. So table one lists some observations regarding diffusion and osmosis. Complete table one by stating whether each observation occurs by diffusion or osmosis and giving a reason for your choice. All right, so let's go through these observations. So the first one says amino acids from digested food pass across the wall of the small intestine. So this clearly would have to be diffusion. So amino acids, they are solutes. So always remember diffusion is a movement of solutes from a high concentration to a low concentration. So typically we're going to have a high concentration of amino acids inside of the small intestines. So they are going to cross over the small intestines wall and get into the bloodstream where there's going to be a lower concentration of amino acids. So we have that concentration gradient set up. So this would have to be diffusion. So we're looking at the movement of solutes from a high to low concentration. All right, the second observation, we have garden slugs shrivel when salt is sprinkled on them. So this is going to be the process of osmosis being observed. So when you add salt to, when you sprinkle salt on these slugs, this is going to increase the solute concentration inside the slugs, inside the cells of the slug. So you're adding salt, you're increasing the salt concentration. Salts are solutes. So there's a higher solute concentration inside the slugs compared to the outside. So typically when, when salt is being added to the, the, the slugs, that is going to kind of cause water to be extracted from the cells. So water is going to be leaving the cells and that is going to be through the process of osmosis. So imagine that the, the fluids surrounding the, the cells of the slug, that would be more concentrated than inside of the cell. So this is what's going to cause the water to actually leave the cells and cause the slug to shrivel up. So it's osmosis that we're observing here because we're looking at how water is moving out of the, the slug, causing the shriveling. Now, the third observation, we have saltwater fish die when they are placed into freshwater aquaria. 
So normally salt water fish should be placed in salt water for survival. So if you place salt water fish in fresh water aquarium, fresh water is just pure water, no salts. So there's no concentration of salt, anything like that. So you could imagine that that fresh water is going to have a much higher water concentration compared to the inside of the salt water fish. So we have this concentration gradient set up. So naturally water is going to enter from the fresh water into the salt water fish because we have, as I said, a concentration gradient is set up. There's more water surrounding the salt water fish in that, that, that fresh water. There's more water in that fresh water. So that is going to start to enter the salt water fish and cause the salt water fish to eventually swell up. So water is entering the cells, the cells swell, they eventually burst because when there's too much water coming in, cells burst, they can't expand any further, there's no cell wall to to um retain the shape of the cell to keep it in con in, in to keep it intact. So therefore the salt water fish they eventually are going to die. So this is a process of osmosis also being observed here with these salt water fish. And the fourth observation, we have oxygen moves from the alveoli to the blood. So the alveoli are the tiny air sacs present in the lungs of the respiratory system. So this is an example of diffusion. So here now we're looking at a gas diffusing instead of solutes like the first um, observation we looked at. So oxygen gas is going to be of a higher concentration in the alveoli compared to the blood. So naturally through diffusion, oxygen is going to move across the alveoli and get into the blood. So that is diffusion of gases shown there. So eight marks to complete that table. Part E, at school, Mona is studying the structure of specialized plant and animal tissues, such as xylem vessels and red blood cells. She notes that xylem vessels and red blood cells have unique structures. Part 1. Explain to Mona two ways in which the structure of the xylem vessel is uniquely suited for its functions. Write your responses under the headings in Table 2. So the structure of the xylem vessel. So the first structure I describe is the narrow elongated tubes that the xylem vessels are made of. So this is necessary for helping the upward pull of water through the plant. So we want the water to be pulled upward from roots to the leaves. And this is through capillarity forces. So forces, these forces include cohesion and adhesion. So picture the xylem vessels as straws. So you know straws are these narrow tubes that we use to drink with. So we're suctioning up the liquid and Similarly here with the xylem vessels, you want a narrow tube, a nice elongated narrow tube to help with the suction of the liquid upwards. So cohesion is the forces that, that would attract water molecules to each other, while adhesion would attract the water molecules to the walls of the xylem. So the combination of those forces that would allow water to be suctioned up the narrow tubes. So the narrowness of these tubes enhance the, the upward pull of the water through the xylem. The second feature I have is the lack of cross walls. So there's no cross walls in the xylem vessels. So there's nothing blocking or presenting a barrier to the continuous upward flow of water. So you want that continuous stream of water up through the xylem vessels. So you're just going to have a fully hollow open xylem vessel without any cross walls, any barriers there. Other features you can talk about would be the fact that the xylem vessels are made of dead cells. So these dead cells are necessary to prevent water from reacting in the cells. So the whole point of xylem is for the transport of water along with minerals up through the plant. Now, if the cells of the xylem were living, then that would 
pose a problem because the water is going to be stopping and reacting within the cells, carrying out different reactions and functions within the cells. We don't want that. So it's important that the xylem vessels are made up of dead cells. And then the next feature you can talk about would be the lignified walls of the xylem vessels. So that is going to help strengthen and give the, the plant, the stem, um, the support it needs. So keeping the plant upright. So that, that is the importance of the lignified walls. So that's four marks for completing that, that table. Okay, so part two, explain to Mona two ways in which the structure of the red blood cell is uniquely suited to its functions. Write your responses under the headings in table three. Okay, so this is similar to the table with the xylem vessels. So now we're talking about red blood cells. So the first structure I have here is describing the flexible biconcave nature of the red blood cells. So their flexibility is going to allow for easy movement to squeeze through small blood vessels such as capillaries. So we want those red blood cells to be able to easily pass through small blood vessels. And then the biconcave shape, that provides a large surface area to volume ratio for more efficient diffusion of gases. So when you think of a biconcave disc, that's how the red blood cells are shaped. That means that they're a little thicker around the perimeter, around the edges, and flatter within the middle. So kind of think of a donut. So that, that is the shape of the red blood cell. The second um, structure and the feature that you can talk about is the lack of the nucleus. So this is an important feature in red blood cells. Because most cells, all cells are supposed to have a nucleus. You know, the nucleus is like the brain of the cell controlling different activities. But the red blood cells, they do not have a nucleus. And the reason for this is that it's going to provide more space inside of the cell for hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the red pigment that binds to oxygen and therefore transports oxygen around the body. So going back to the function of the red blood cells. So red blood cells are needed to transport oxygen around the body. So the lack of nucleus is important. So we have more space for a hemoglobin. And that hemoglobin can now attract as much oxygen as possible. And then allow the red blood cell to transport the oxygen around the body. So that table is four marks. So that is the end of question one. So a total of 25 marks there. To watch the rest of solutions for this paper, as well as many other past papers, visit my website bioaid.teachable.com to enroll in a course today.